All right, welcome everybody to today's installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from Mary Coolidge on From the Desert to Coast, the Case for Dark Skies. Uh, next week we will be hearing from same day, same time, Saturday, 10 o'clock, and we'll be learning about using DNA profiling and spatial predictive models to assess breeding grounds, breeding ground origins of humpback whales in the East Northern Pacific. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Dubois, and I'm the communications coordinator for the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. It's a pleasure to coordinate this speaker series. Um, the Cape Perpetual Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, and awareness in stewardship from the land and sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles to our work are community engagement, leveraging resources, and engaging in partnerships. As you can see at the bottom, uh, we have a variety of founding partners, uh, including federal agencies, state agencies, some local uh, agencies, uh, as well as some nonprofits and the Coos, uh, tri Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Saisla Indians. Uh, our focus is on the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, uh, the biggest uh, of five in Oregon. And in addition to protected uh, marine protected area to the north and the south, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. Um, and today's fun fact, I always like to share a fun fact, um, is that within the marine res Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve, uh, there are uh, creatures large and small that live in various habitats from sand, gravel, and have some of the most biologically diverse rocky intertidal habitats anywhere in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we uh, are, have a project on iNaturalist and would invite you to engage in a worldwide species monitoring program to help document this biodiversity. Uh, you can download an app to your phone. It looks like just this little green bird up here you see um, and just search for iNaturalist. Um, and you can do it anywhere in the world, but if you are in the Cape Perpetua area, uh, please connect up with the Cape Perpetua BioBlitz series project on iNaturalist, and that will help us document the observations you take in this area. And I will include links uh, to iNaturalist for you in the chat as well in just a moment. Uh, the collaborative also hosts a variety of other uh, community science projects, as you can see here. Some of them are annually, some of them are monthly. Um, and we also host a Young Scientist webinar series on the second Tuesday of every month, October through April. Um, we'll have our last one up this coming April. Uh, you can find out more information about when all of these events and presentations take place on our website at capeperpetualcollaborative.org and click on the events tab and that'll take you to our calendar. And I encourage you to connect with us on our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel, uh, where we do house all of the recordings from our presentations uh, on our YouTube channel, as well as on our blog. And with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, Mary Coolidge. Uh, she's Autobahn's Bird Safe Campaign Coordinator, working with architects, planners, designers, and residents to reduce hazards for birds in the built environment while meeting other design, building performance, and climate change objectives. She is dedicated to improving efforts to make urban environments more hospitable to wildlife, to helping connect people to nature and place, and to fall in love with the deep mysteries of the night. Mary splits her time between Portland Audubon and Oregon's California Condor Breeding Program. And with that, Mary, it's all yours. Um, and we will be doing a, a question and answer after the presentation. So while uh, Mary's presenting, if a question comes about to you, feel free to add that to the chat or the Q&A session, and we will address that at the end. Mary, it is all yours. Okay, good morning. I assume you can hear me okay. Yep, we can hear you and your PowerPoint showing beautifully. Excellent. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Tara. I really appreciate the invitation to be here as part of this talk series. And thank you also to everybody who's joining us this morning. Um, I want to mention that I am also on the board of the Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association in, a, in addition to being on staff at Portland Audubon. Um, but so my aim 
today is really to build a case for the importance of dark skies and why we should be preserving them across all habitats. Now, because humans are diurnal by nature, we tend to think a lot more about daytime um, and we tend to plan for daytime and for the daytime experience as opposed to the nighttime experience. But I really wanna get folks thinking about the incredible beauty and mystery of the night and about darkness as actual habitat that is critically important for both nocturnal and diurnal species. So for four and a half billion years, there was no artificial electric light on this planet and all biological systems evolved under these regular cycles of dark nights and bright days, which set up all of our biological processes to be governed by those light dark cycles. This is essentially our master clock on earth and it drives all of our circadian rhythms, which then in turn govern our sleeping patterns, eating, foraging, migration, breeding, um, flowering and plants and leaf drop, uh, et cetera. You name it, it's governed by circadian rhythms. And here's where we are today. So this is a NASA satellite photo. I believe it's from 2011. So it's a little bit outdated at this point. Um, but this photo really illustrates well um, how in the last 130 years or so, we've lit the night on a global scale with um, the installation of electric lighting on our city streets. Um, so much so that today, most people live in urban areas and are awash in light from street lights and billboards and sports field lighting, security lighting, empty parking lots, um, all kinds of things that we light through the night. And when we light the night like this, we're interrupting circadian rhythms that are set by those natural light dark cycles um, in ourselves, but also in birds and mammals and fish and reptiles and invertebrates and in plants. And this is how we get there. So all that light that's visible from those satellite photos, this is what it looks like on the ground. We have a tendency to overlight our nights with fixtures that are poorly aimed, are unshielded, that point light either up or point it out, that are probably too bright for what it is they're trying to illuminate, and that are on when we aren't even using them. And, you know, we need light, we absolutely need light, but we can design it better to minimize that creation of light pollution and um, unnecessary excess lighting, because that light isn't benign, it actually has consequences. Um, so this is the Bortle scale. It was invented in 2001 by a guy named Bortle. And um, it was designed to help us, uh, astronomers, amateur astronomers, evaluate the relative quality of darkness of their observation sites and the interference of light pollution. The scale ranges from um, the right-hand side here, one excellent dark sky site, over to the left, an eight or a nine inner city um, sky site. So you have grays and blacks on the right, you know, you go through greens and blues and then over to warmer colors and all the way to white when you get into more light pollution. So if you're in Yahats, you're actually on the cusp of a three to four in that green blue area, you still have pretty incredible night sky viewing conditions. Um, even better if you get just south of town into the Syusula National Forest, the Cape Perpetua area, Hesita Head, um, Carl Washburn State Park. Um, you get some really incredible night skies there. And here's what that Bortle scale looks like more or less on a map. This was updated in 2016. Um, this is the New World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness that was developed by a team of Italian astronomers and a NOAA researcher. Um, this is a global map of light pollution and it's based on infrared imaging. This illustrates a pretty staggering picture of the extent of light pollution in the United States and globally if you look at their entire um, map. And then when they overlaid this with population data, they found that 99% of people in the United States live under light polluted skies and 80% of people can't see the Milky Way from home. So pretty sobering, you all should feel lucky that you can probably see the Milky Way from home or pretty near home. You can see that um, west of the Mississippi, we're in much better shape than folks east of the Mississippi, but we still obviously have light pollution. Um, so we need to start being more thoughtful about how we design our lighting so we can make sure we don't end up like the East Coast. 
So now if we zoom in on Oregon, you can see here that Yahats has some of the least light polluted skies on the Oregon coast. Um, this is a real opportunity area. It is much easier to preserve dark skies while you still have them than to try to restore them once you've lost them. So that's just something to keep in mind as we talk more today about the value of dark skies. Meanwhile, we are also um, in the midst of a global wave of conversion from generally high pressure sodium to LED fixtures. LEDs are fantastic um, in general. They are energy efficient. They tend to be very long lived. They're relatively low maintenance. Um, and it was widely believed that the conversion from LED, from high pressure sodium to LED would actually start to reduce global light pollution. But that's not what's happening. In fact, light pollution is growing on average about 2% per year. In some places, it's growing much more rapidly, but at average over the globe, 2% per year. And that's in part because we overuse it. It's really inexpensive to run. And so we tend to use more LEDs than we used of our um, high pressure sodium predecessors. Um, the other thing is that early generation LEDs, which we still tend to be using, produce a lot of blue rich white light, which is um, something that mimics daylight. It's shorter wavelength light. It scatters more readily in the atmosphere than longer wavelength light. And it produces this spike in the blue portion of the wavelength spectrum. So you can actually see it there on the screen, that blue spike at about 450 nanometers. That's also the peak sensitivity range for birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, and also humans. And what that does is it suppresses melatonin secretion in all vertebrates, including humans, um, and that makes it hard, hard for us to sleep. So in 2016, the American Medical Association released a report um, recommending that municipalities stay away from this kind of lighting when they're converting their streetlights because of concerns about the role that blue rich white light potentially plays in increasing the risk of prostate cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and also because this kind of light can create a lot of glare and that glare can actually cause permanent retinal damage. Historically, light pollution was really um, kind of the complaint of astronomers, but these days there's something called ecological light pollution and it's a field of research that is huge and growing. Um, ecosystems are incredibly complex. Um, when we create artificial light at night, we are disrupting the very careful choreography of um, our biological systems. That's, this is a quote on the screen from Travis Longcore. He is one of the leading researchers on this globally. He's down at USC in Southern California and doing a lot of research on um, ecological impacts of light pollution. Um, so the night is actually habitat for uh, all bats, 90% of amphibians, 70% of mammals, and 60% of invertebrates. And all of these nocturnal species are incredibly adapted to darkness. So light pollution can actually confuse celestial navigation in both nocturnal and diurnal species. We're going to look at examples of all of these can cause disorientation and misorientation in nocturnal movements of animals, can um, attract and repel various species, can impact predator-prey relationships, um, can actually extend the activity of diurnal species into nighttime hours, and as we talked about, can interrupt circadian rhythms that um, guide most behaviors that are happening on the planet. So there are hundreds and hundreds of peer reviewed published scientific papers on the impact of light pollution, looking at everything from individual species level impacts up to ecosystem level impacts. And the truth is that none of it is good news. Um, it's all pretty much bad news. <laughs> and this is just a tiny, tiny sample. Um, the widespread impacts of light pollution are incredibly well documented at this point. So let's dig into some examples. Um, most birds migrate at night. Um, that includes warblers and thrushes, sparrows, kinglets, siskins, grosbeaks. So all kinds of birds are migrating at night. And they do that because they, the atmosphere is less turbulent. 
Um, they can avoid diurnal predators. They can preserve daytime hours for foraging like they ordinarily would. And they're also using the stars to navigate. Um, so in a very generalized sense of bird um, migration, they take off about 30 to 45 minutes after sunset. They will orient using the North Star, sometimes Orion, the Big Dipper, and they'll fly all night long if conditions are good for migration until they come into areas where there is um, light pollution and then they get into trouble because the stars that they're using to navigate are drowned out. Um, birds are also phototoxic or attracted to light. So light pollution also draws them off their migration pathways into lit areas. Uh, this is a research paper that was done on the tribute in light in lower Manhattan, which has been illuminated one night a year since 2002. Um, New York City Audubon folks started noticing birds entrapped in these fires of light. And you can see that in that in the photo on the left, all of those white lines, those are birds that are just circling in those spires of light. So those folks negotiated a deal to have the lights extinguished when a critical threshold of birds was seen collecting in those spires. And then in 2008, um, New York City Audubon and Fordham University started actually studying the issue. Um, and they were collecting data using radar technology that they used to measure bird density in the area. So um, what they found generally is that when the spires were lit, birds aggregated in the area. When the spires were dark, birds dispersed. So if you look at the upper right hand corner of this screen in that white box, um, you'll see a key in the lower right hand corner that shows bird density. So blues on the left, that's relatively low density. Reds on the right, that's relatively high density. So now if you look above that, you can see there's a box that has September 12th, 2015. It's 2, 12 a.m. The spire lights are out and the color of that radar screen is mostly blues, relatively low density. There are about 500 birds within a half a kilometer of the tribute in lights. If you look in the box below that, it's 2.32 a.m., 20 minutes later, the lights are illuminated, and there are now about 15,700 birds that have aggregated within a half a kilometer of the Tribute in Light. Um, so 15,700 birds from 500 when those lights came on. Now these lights cast um, light four kilometers up into the sky, so it, this is a massive amount of light. And this attraction to light is not a new phenomenon. I mean, it's been documented at lighthouses since the 1800s. It's been documented at airport ceilingometers since at least the 1950s. Um, it's not very common to see this intensity of light, um, but it does provide evidence of what's happening when we're pulling birds off of their migration pathways by casting light up into the sky. Um, this is the Standard Insurance Building in Galveston, Texas. Um, this building killed 395 birds in one night in the spring of 2017. Um, three birds survived the collision and were taken to rehab, and the building did subsequently extinguish their lights for the remainder of the migration season. This is nowhere near the amount of light that's being created by the Tribune and Light, but obviously still posing a hazard for birds that are on their migration pathways. Um, luckily, there are tools that now help us concentrate our efforts to reduce light pollution during migration season. Um, researchers, as I mentioned on that last project, are now using radar technology to track um, density of birds and movement of birds on migration and then alert us to these high density migration nights. So migration is really more than three months in fall and more than three months in spring. And yet most birds are gonna pass over Oregon, in this case, in about a one month peak period. So in the spring, about mid-April to mid-May, and in the fall, about mid-September to mid-October. That way we can really focus our efforts on helping keep them on their migration pathways. So this is an example of a lights out alert that is published by the Aero Eco Lab out of Colorado State University. And they post um, red, orange, and yellow alerts that signal large movements of birds. The red alerts are reported on nights that have more than 50% of the peak movement of birds. And generally there are about 10 of these red alert nights in a season. And the objective is to really try to get people to turn off 
their unnecessary lighting, at least during the peaks of migration. So this comes from an Oregon alert last May, May 15th and 16th, which triggered a red alert for the northwest half of the state and an orange alert for the southeast half of the state when there was a forecast of 6.3 million birds flying over Oregon in a single night. And of course, um, light pollution impacts go well beyond bird migration. So um, I know we don't have any dung beetles in Oregon, but I think this is a pretty cool story, so I like to tell it. Dung beetles have actually been shown to use the Milky Way for orientation. So dung beetles show up to a dung, dung pile. It's a melee of competition. They roll a ball of dung. They get it off the pile. They climb on top of it. They do a little dance, and they take snapshots of the night sky. Then they roll their balls in a straight line home. Researchers that were studying how they do this found that they were successful doing this under fully starry skies and also in a planetarium where they were shown only the Milky Way. But basically they went in circles when they were under planetarium skies that had this, the Milky Way blotted out. So pretty amazing stuff that these insects can use the Milky Way to navigate. Harbor seals have also been shown to steer by the stars. So these are animals that are potentially traveling long distances um, across the ocean without terrestrial landmarks. Um, and they've been shown in a swimming planetarium to pick out a lodestar on the horizon, follow it until it drops out of view below the horizon, and then they already have another star picked out that they can continue to follow after that first one is out of view. Better than I can do, people. Um, Sea turtles, this is probably one of the most famous examples of misorientation as a result of artificial light. Um, so female sea turtles are actually using the Earth's magnetic field to navigate to their natal beaches. They climb up onto a dry part of the beach. They fling sand with their flippers to construct a body pit. They'll dig an egg pit using their rear flippers, and then they lay about 100 eggs, cover them up out to sea. They're not coming back to that nest. Incubation takes about 60 days, and then the sea turtle hatchlings will group dig out of their nest and orient themselves to the brightest horizon, which without light pollution would be toward the ocean. Um, in areas where there's a lot of artificial light pollution, sea turtle hatchlings move upward toward the lights instead of toward the ocean. And, you know, most of these guys are going to die anyway. I think they have about a 75% mortality rate but their first order of business is to get out to the ocean. Um, so anything we can do to make sure we can get them out there um, is a leg up for them. A lot has been done in places where sea turtles are nesting um, to help reduce this phenomenon. Bats. Um, so there are 15 species of bats in Oregon. 14 of them have been documented in the high desert of southeastern Oregon, but I was surprised to find that fully 11 of these have been documented on the Central Coast. And bats are really incredibly cool. Um, they are nocturnal and crepuscular, which means that they become active in, at dusk. And they are incredibly well adapted um, to extremely low light conditions. These are really beneficial insect eaters, which is an ecosystem service to humans. They can eat over 50% of their body weight in a single night, um, in, in insects in a single night. And then a lactating female can actually eat her entire body weight in insects in a single night. Now, some bats are attracted to streetlights for foraging, um, particularly around lights that are concentrating large numbers of insects. And other studies are showing us that some kinds of, of LED lighting, particularly blue rich white light, can attract up to 48% more insects than their high pressure sodium predecessors. So that's creating a real buffet at some of our street lights. Um, and these guys have been documented using the same street lights night after night to do this habitual behavior. So California myotis and Yuma myotis are both species that are potentially engaging in this kind of behavior, which puts them at, at increased risk of predation by owls and other predators. Then there are other species like pipistrels, for example, that will actually avoid lights. So a line of street lights is more or less a wall to them. They just won't cross it. So we're really modifying the nighttime environment to the advantage of some bats and the detriment of others, 
but with some unintended consequences, secondary consequences as well. Uh, so repulsion behavior. Um, a lot of amphibians are repelled by light. Um, salamanders and frogs in particular will um, restrict their movements under full moon nights in order to avoid predation, and they hunt more on moonless nights. And ecologists back east tested this on um, eastern red-backed salamanders that normally emerge from the leaf litter about an hour after dusk. And they found that when they exposed certain areas to even very dim lighting, so string lighting, they could delay the emergence of these eastern red-backed salamanders for an additional hour. So that reduces the amount of time they have to be out um, feeding, dispersing, finding mates, and reproducing. I haven't seen any studies on the western red-backed salamander, which is photographed on the left. I found that at Carl Washburn State Park. Um, but presumably there would be some similar behavioral impacts to um, the Western redback salamander. Impacts to nesting. Um, so this is a study that looked at corticosterone levels or stress hormone levels in nesting birds. And these birds were exposed to green, red, and white LEDs um, over their nest areas. And the researchers found that birds that were exposed to white light LEDs had elevated um, corticosterone or stress hormone levels, and that that was also correlated with a reduced ability to fledge young, so fewer young getting out of their nests. Another study actually found that artificial lighting caused experimental birds to um, wake up earlier, sleep less, and spend less time um, incubating and brooding on their nests, um, leaving their nests earlier in the morning, um, and potentially impacting the success of their nesting. So light pollution can actually have implications for bird nesting success as well. There are relatively fewer research papers on the impact of light pollution on coastal systems um, compared with other ecosystems. Excuse me, but there is still plenty of information out there and again, none of it is good news. So this is, again, just a small sampling of the papers looking at light pollution impacts on marine and coastal systems. Research from 2010 says that about 22% of our coastal ecosystems um, have, are impacted by light pollution. So if that statistic comes from 11 years ago, you can bet that that number has really increased. And estuary and coastal ecosystems are some of the most heavily used and threatened um, natural systems globally. And we also know that um, light pollution from coastal urban development is widespread and actually poses an increasing threat to biodiversity in these systems. Um, these coastal ecosystems are providing really important what we call ecosystem services. Um, having intact coastal ecosystem, ecosystem functioning is really important in preserving water quality, in protection from um, providing pr protection from flooding and storm events, in providing ecosystem connectivity, and also recreation for humans. So there's an economic piece here as well as an ecosystem impact if light pollution is, is degrading these intertidal systems. I found this headline in the Oregon Coast Beast Beach Connection. Um, the lowly sand flea, they should be exalted on the Oregon coast. And I really kind of love that. If not for themselves, then at least for the critical role that they're playing in the ecosystem. So these guys eat detritus that washes up on the beach, things like decaying seaweed and dead organisms. And they also provide food for shorebirds, for octopi, for fish. And under artificial lighting regimes, they actually concentrate under those lights, especially LED lights, which then potentially increases their risk of predation by birds and fish, which then subsequently are actually putting themselves at risk as well. So birds that are concentrating under lights at night and fish that are concentrating under lights at night um, are also at increased risk. So we're, again, imbalancing that um, very carefully choreographed system. Let's talk a little bit about humans. Um, so we have non-image forming cells in our eyes that are sensitive to blue light. And that tells our brain that it's time to wake up. 
This suppresses melatonin secretion in our systems and it impairs our ability to sleep. This is the kind of light that's actually emitted by all of our devices, our computers, our cell phones. So whether you have an iPhone or an Android or a Mac or a PC, you have a night shift setting that actually dials down that blue light that is emitted after a certain time in the evening. Some of them are auto set to on, some of them you actually have to go in and manually turn on. But if you are somebody who's interacting with a device within two hours before you are attempting to go to sleep and you're having trouble sleeping, make sure you go and activate these, set these settings in your phone and your computer. Um, at the same time, street lights around the world are being converted to LEDs. And unfortunately, many of them are being converted to LEDs that have this high blue content. And again, in 2016, the American Medical Association released a report saying that blue rich white light may be related to increased risk of cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And they made this recommendation that municipalities not convert to this kind of lighting. So if you're having trouble sleeping, another thing to consider is whether the street light in front of your house is casting light into your bedroom. Um, I don't know if the central Lincoln PUD will actually come out and shield or tilt or relamp your light if you're having a problem with it, but it's absolutely worth looking into. This is a study that is really interesting. It came out of the Stanford Sleep Epidemiology Lab. And what they found is that artificial light at night alters sleep behavior. So they studied 16,000 people for eight years, and they found that folks who lived in areas with higher outdoor night lighting um, also had delayed sleep onset, they had decreased total sleep time, they had lower sleep quality, and they had symptoms consistent with what is now being diagnosed as circadian rhythm disorder. And what's particularly scary about this study is that they found that th these conditions occurred even if people went home and slept with blackout curtains. So the light that you're exposed to, even in the evening, long before you go to bed, can delay your sleep, um, your ability to go to sleep. I think it's important in the time of climate change to think about how this pencils out in terms of um, energy efficiency in terms of money and in terms of impacts to climate change. So the International Dark Sky Association crunched numbers from a Department of Energy 2011 report that found, and they found that 35% of light is wasted because it's poorly designed. Um, and that amounts to $3 billion a year of energy lost and 15 million tons of CO2. So in this time of climate change bearing down on us, Adopting best practices in lighting design is a really sound sustainability practice. And thankfully, best practices have been developed. Um, the key points are to minimize unnecessary lighting, to fully shield fixtures, make sure that light is aimed down, not up and not out, down where we actually need it. Um, limit the total brightness of your fixtures, Choose warm color lamps for outdoor use. So 3000 Kelvins max, 2700 Kelvins even better. So warmer light, light that's a little yellower and not so white. And then of course, using adaptive controls like motion sensors or dimmers, which is a good sustainability practice anyway. <clears throat> we tend to think that more light is equivalent to more safety. And the data when this has been studied just doesn't bear that out. Um, we absolutely need lighting, but we need better lighting, not necessarily more lighting, unless we're talking about absolutely light deficient areas and then go ahead and light it. But in a lot of cases, safety can be improved with better lighting, um, more so than just installing more lighting. Um, overly bright lighting can create these glare bombs um, which constrict our pupils and make it harder for us to transition from bright areas into darker areas, especially as we age. And that means over 40, um, it's harder for our eyes to adjust when we're moving from a brightly lit area into a dark area. So the photo there at the top is showing an unshielded light fixture, creating a lot of glare. Um, you can't see that there's a person standing in that gate. 
as soon as the photographer puts a hand up to create a shield over that light, now you can see that there's somebody standing in that open gate. Um, I want to quickly point out the middle study on the right is the Chicago Alley Lighting Project. Um, this was a project from 2000 where um, alleys were increased both in the frequency and the wattage of their lighting. And then crime statistics were looked at before and after that lighting was changed. And they found a 21% increase in crime on those alleyways after more lighting was installed. So we need to rethink our um, perception of how lighting relates to safety. So the question is really, can we simultaneously light our cities and towns to make them pleasant, vibrant, safe places to be while also um, ensuring that we are not creating a massive amount of light pollution? And the answer is yes. A lot of these photos are taken from New York. Um, one of them is from Houston. One of them is for Amsterdam. So if we can do really good sense of place ambient lighting in big cities, I think we can do it anywhere. Um, okay, so back to dark skies and yachts. Um, here's that map again. You can locate yourselves over there on the central coast. Um, astrotourism is a hugely growing interest area. Everyone has written about it from Forbes to the New York Times, to the Oregonian. I found a few references to astrotourism on the Oregon coast um, online. So the Dirt published something, Travel Oregon published something. And so did the Oregon Coast Be Beach Connection. In fact, they um, talked about yachts. So given yachts relatively low level of light pollution and really magnificent dark skies, there is an, a, a pretty amazing opportunity that you all have here as a community to come together and preserve the night sky that you have, um, which is an amazing natural resource before you potentially lose it. Um, right, with growth comes more light pollution. Perhaps there is even an opportunity here to promote stargazing in yachts. Um, and if there was real interest, maybe even to be designated as an international dark sky place. So I know some of you are probably thinking you can't depend on clear night skies on the Oregon coast. And I think that's true. Um, but I got online and I did a search and I found a lot of photos that people have taken of magnificent night skies on the Oregon coast. Um, so there are folks who are certainly capitalizing on this resource and are figuring out ways um, to photograph it and to do night sky viewing there. Uh, this is a little plug from the um, Oregon chapter of the International Dark Sky Association. So our chapter has a light pollution monitoring project where we have sky quality meters that are installed in 15 sites currently to collect measurements on sky, sky conditions at those locations. There is a plan to expand this year to add 13 additional sites. Um, those are the red markers on that right hand map. Um, we also have big data gaps in the northeast section of the this, this state and most of the western portion of the state south of the Portland metropolitan area. So we are looking for volunteers who will manage um, sky quality meter locations. So if you're interested, you can reach out to IDA Oregon at darksky.org or you can get in touch with me. Um, and other ways that you can help protect the night sky you can support the adoption of a lighting ordinance in Yahats. You can also, if you're noticing that you have light cast into your home um, from a street light, you can request a shield from either ODOT or from um, the, the public utility. Uh, you can also request relamping with a 3000 Kelvin bulb from either of those entities. Now, they may not volunteer to do it before that light burns out, and LEDs do have about a 20-year lifespan. Um, but if something goes wrong with one of the lights, you can ask them to ensure that they're going to relamp with 3,000 Kelvin or below, rather than the 4,000 Kelvins that are probably existing there now. Um, get outside to see the stars and appreciate what you have. Maybe even help organize a star party event in Yahats. And then, of course, you can volunteer with IDA Oregon if you're interested. Okay, um, that's all I have to yarn on about. Um, and I think there are probably questions. 
Yeah, we did have a couple come in. There is um, a question I always like to kick off with, and that is kind of, it, was there an aha moment for you or what was what's your inspiration around working um, with dark skies and um, doing more research and, and learning about that? Yeah. Um... You know, back when I first started at Audubon in 2009, I ran our community science program and we knew that birds were hitting buildings in at some cities back east, but we didn't really know what was happening locally in Portland, apart from some anecdotal data that we had from our, our wildlife care center. And so we established a collision monitoring program and I really just read everything I could about the impacts of light pollution on bird migration, how that was functioning um, to increase the collision rates in our country. You know, then once I got wind of what IDA was working on, I really started to look at what the light pollution impacts were far beyond bird migration impacts. And it just all came together and I drank the Kool-Aid, I guess, and I haven't been able to look at lighting the same since. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Have there been, do you know if there's been studies of the use of bright motion lights on animals at night? Um, I haven't seen any specific studies on that. I mean, motion lighting tends to be better than steady burning light all night long. Um, it's definitely better in terms of safety and security because you have the element of surprise. I have a motion light on my front porch and if it comes on, I know there's either a cat, a raccoon or a human on my front porch. And so it does feel okay. safe to me. Um, any lighting that's too bright is gonna have an impact, right? So um, if you're gonna put your lighting on a motion sensor, that's better than steady burning. Also even better if you can get some of the lumen output down on okay. that lighting. Okay. Um, there's a question here on if the presentation will be available uh, for people to watch later. Yes, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website and our YouTube channel uh, by Monday afternoon. I usually get them up on Monday morning. So by Monday afternoon, it will be available. Um, Tuesday morning, uh, a link will go out to everybody who's registered with a link directly to our YouTube channel too. So it's really easy to find. Um, do you have... Okay, let's see here. How, any ideas on how to talk to neighbors that keep porch lights on all night? Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's a tender subject, right? Because people have their lighting on for some reason, likely because they feel like it helps keep their home safer. I don't think anybody intends to be a bad neighbor. I think oftentimes people don't realize the impact that they're having on their neighbors when they have lights on all night long. Um, I would say first and foremost, make sure you have developed a relationship with that person before you start complaining to them about their lighting. They're gonna be a lot more receptive if you've already built some rapport and some trust with them. Um, and then I think that there are good neighbor ways to talk about lighting. Most times, again, people have no idea the kind of impact they're potentially having. There are resources if you go to the International Dark Sky Association website, um, if you go to the Portland Audubon website, or if you go to the IDA Oregon website, all three of those have resources that you could share with your neighbors, a flyer about the impacts of light pollution. Um, there are programs in Portland, we have something called Take the Pledge to Go Lights Out, and people who sign up get a plaque. People in Portland are really into their yard signs, so they get a plaque um, and we just ask them to do a home evaluation of their night lighting and look for opportunities to dial it back. So having a sign like that in your front yard, I think is a really good way to create a little bit of curiosity and then contagion about improving your night lighting. Um, so I don't know if somebody in the city of Yahats has the capacity to develop a program like that, but uh, the Portland Audubon program, we're happy to share all of the resources that we have with anybody else who wants to establish a program like that. Very cool. Do you know of research or information on how nighttime lighting affects nocturnal birds, such as uh, owls and night jars? Yeah, um, there are definitely a lot of papers out there. Um, the So owl predation success 
improves as lighting um, increases. So they tend to have they would tend to have better success under a full moon than on a dark night. However, their prey species are pretty smart about it. And so they restrict their activity under full moon nights. So now, you know, in Portland, when we have 45,000 full moons shining down on every block all throughout the city every single night of the year, we're definitely influencing those predator prey relationships. Are the owls having better hunting success? Are the prey species hiding more? So actually, you know, foraging less and dispersing less and mating less and all of that kind of thing. There's definitely some interesting research out there, even research on hunting success between red morph barn owls and white morph barn owls. Um, night jars, there is some interesting work being done looking at night jars, which actually fluoresce. Um, only visible, that fluorescence is only visible if you have a UV flashlight or if you can see into the UV spectrum. Nobody knows exactly why they have this. Owls have fluorescence, night jars have fluorescence, um, northern flying squirrels have fluorescence, and there's something there about communication. It may actually be about camouflage with lichens that are fluorescing. Um, you know, there's a lot more information to be collected out there, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's interested, I do have a spreadsheet with every article I've come upon looking at the impacts of light pollution on ecological systems, on human health, et cetera, and I'm happy to share that. So feel free to email me and I can send that to you. Very cool. And how about indoor lighting? Someone uh, talks here about, uh, you know, is indoor lighting harmful and would it be good for people to turn off their indoor lights when they're not in use? Yeah, I mean, it depends on exactly what you're asking about in terms of your own health impacts and your ability to sleep. For sure, um, it would be better to have warm lighting that you're exposed to in the evening. Whereas during the day, if you want to have, I have a kitchen light um, that dims and as it dims, it becomes warmer lighting. So when it's on its full capacity, it's a pretty bright light so that we can do kitchen surgery. Um, but then as the night wears on, I make sure that that's really dialed down to be warmer light so that it's not having an impact on my melatonin levels and affecting my ability to sleep. Um, indoor lighting can actually also help contribute to light pollution. Um, so certainly during migration season, we recommend that people draw their blinds or close their curtains or just not have lights that are right in their windows. And any suggestions on Christmas light alternatives? Um, I guess that depends on whether we're talking about um, old school incandescents versus LEDs. Um, you know, there has been some research that demonstrates that light detectable from space increases in the weeks before Christmas and after Christmas. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't have any impact, but in the Pacific Northwest, I'm not going to tell anybody that they can't have Christmas lights up. The days get short, it's dark, it's stormy. We need light in our lives, right? We need a little magic. So that's not the thing that I'm most worried about. Um, if you're worried about LEDs, you actually still can get incandescent um, Christmas lights. If you look online, I think like a thousand bulbs.com sells incandescent Christmas lights. And then do you know if there are assistance available both in design and financial for businesses to upgrade their lighting to be more environmentally friendly and energy efficient? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Energy Trust of Oregon does deal specifically with helping people, businesses, as well as residential homes um, to reduce their, to, to improve their energy efficiency. Um, a lot of that has to do with lighting. So yeah, Energy Trust of Oregon. Locally, you may find other resources. In Portland, we have Clean Energy Works. We have Better Buildings. We have, um, we have a number of programs in Portland. Energy Trust of Oregon is the only one that I know that operates statewide. But if you go to their website and you follow the business track, you'll be able to find um, resources and incentives to actually switch out your lighting. Okay. 
Um, and then here's a question about fishing vessels. It says many of the fishing vessels are now using LED lights. Do you know of any research on how this might be impacting the marine life? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, everything from fish attraction um, to birds actually crashing into those lit boats. Um, it was already somewhat problematic before they were LEDs, but it's definitely more concerning now that they're probably in large part using blue rich white light LEDs. I haven't specifically read any of these papers because it's a little bit outside of my um, purview. But I know they're out there. And if somebody's particularly interested in that, I'd be happy to do a little bit of research and turn up some papers on that. So email me. Um, and then Paul here says that uh, he, there are some birders that he knows that shares information about migration times. Can you speak about what these websites and links, um, like words uh, that go out when swans and thrushes are migrating? So like getting alert when different uh, migrations are taking place. Yeah, um, so Oregon Birders Online is probably one of the best resources to get information about um, peaks and migration. Um, if you watch, well, I'm not sure that they actually do species level information at CSU Aero Eco Lab, but if you go to BirdCast, um, which is a Cornell publication, they do actually do species highlights and talk about when mass movements of particular species are going to be coming through. Swainson's thrushes are particularly cool because they're one of the species that uses flight calls. So they're talking to each other while they're migrating. And it can be pretty awesome to go out at three o'clock in the morning and listen for the flight calls of Swainson's thrushes overhead. But yeah, I would check OBAL and maybe BirdCast. Okay. Um, and then we have a landscape uh, lighting contractor uh, chiming in and they would like to know what effect uh, if any, does uplighting tall trees have on attracting insects and any effect on birds, if you know? Yeah, I mean, there are studies like um, the nest box study that I mentioned earlier did, they were looking at very dim lighting that nesting birds were exposed to, and even that had impacts on their sleeping habits and their success in fledging young. Um, the salamander study that I talked about, that was dim lighting, that was string lighting. So we know that it actually doesn't take a ton of light to impact the biology of some of these species. Uplighting on trees, I would say absolutely minimize it. Um, I'm, you know, I tend to be a proponent of not doing it at all, but if you, if you must, then make sure it's controlled so that it's not on all night long. I mean, who's out there enjoying it all night long anyway, except right. the species that you're having detrimental impacts on. <laughs> so I would say make sure it's out by 10 o'clock. Okay. As a fair okay. compromise, if you're gonna do it. And then we have a question here. It's again about migration. The Rose Garden Convention Center spirals and other downtown Portland buildings use colored lights, example, red and green. Do these lights affect the bird migration as well? Yeah, they can, some colors more than others. So red and white light has more impact than blue and green light. Um, blue rich white light is very impactful and the Oregon Convention Center um, did actually relamp their spires about two years ago now as part of an energy efficiency upgrade. And they, we got in touch with them and said we were concerned about their lighting and they just tuned it. Um, so they dialed that white light down and now it's a little bit of a greener light. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. Um, they also had been turning their lights on first thing in the morning for the morning commute. They've stopped doing that and they're turning their lights off an hour earlier during migration season. Okay. Um, so we've had great success working with the Oregon Convention Center, less so with some other buildings, but again, um, red and white are most concerning and blue and green are less concerning. Okay, and that may be similar to this next question as well. Um, it's some private homes and a few hotels have lights that light up the ocean. Um, how does this impact uh, the marine life? And is there a way to do this that is less harmful should it be harmful? 
Yeah, it's definitely harmful. Um, I mean, every study that I've seen looking at lighting, artificial light cast into intertidal ecosystems has demonstrated changes in the behavior and the interactions of the species that are that are being studied. So I would say it, it's absolutely a concern. Um, you know, I guess I would soul search a little bit if I were a resident on the beach or if I were a hotel owner on the beach about why I'm why I'm lighting up the intertidal zone knowing that it, I mean, maybe not knowing, but now knowing that it has de, de, um, deleterious impacts on intertidal species, is it really a necessary activity? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like all principles of lighting, if you can get it warmer and dimmer, that's gonna be better, but you're still gonna be impacting that environment by casting light into it. So I would say the best case scenario is just don't. And if there's some argument for why you must, then make sure that it's warm light and that it's as dim as possible and that it's off by 10 p.m. Okay. And then that is wrapping our questions. We just had someone chime in. Uh, they mentioned that their neighbor uh, on their street had recently asked them to turn off their lights over the summer during some key sky watching nights. And they felt that that was a really nice approach. Um, a nice way to approach people. Um, and it was also a nice experience uh, for their local community without as many lights. So that could be an example for those uh, who are listening or watching um, as a way to approach your neighbors as well and share, uh, like Mary had mentioned, and the beautiful night skies that we have here in the area. Um, and yeah, and again, just some comments about, thank you for the presentation. It was great. It was really nice getting an update on light pollution. Um, so with that, Mary, I'd really like to thank you again for being with us this morning. Really appreciate you joining us on this beautiful Saturday that we have here with the sun. Speaking of beautiful skies. <laughs> yeah. Sunny in Portland too. <laughs> and I hope you have a great weekend. I hope everybody else has a great weekend. And um, with that, uh, this presentation will be available at the beginning of next week. So you can feel free to share it out to anybody who might not be able to attend and might have interest. Um, and I wish you a wonderful weekend and hope to see you at a future presentation. Thanks Bye, everybody. everybody. Get in touch with me if you want to follow up on anything. Bye-bye.